The panel discussion is on feminist voice in the art practice and fears and challenges. And we have Asmina Ranjit, Taiba Begum Lipi, Tasneem Al Sultan, moderated by our very own Tanvi Mishra. Uh, Tanvi is a Tanvi started out as a Tanvi study economics, but started out as a uh, photographer, documentary photographer based out of New Delhi. And now she's also a photo editor, a curator. She's involved with Pix Quarterly in India. She's involved with the editorial team there, and she's also a uh, curator of Delhi Photo Festival. And, and Pix also does a lot of exhibitions after every issue. <coughs> but most importantly, she is the co curator of Photo Kathmandu 2016. So thank you so much for that. So to, to give you the description of the, this panel discussion and. Um, we have next to her Tayeba Begum Lipi, who is an artist based out of Bangladesh. Uh, she formed the Brito Arts Trust uh, together with five other people. She's the co-founder. Uh, and then we have Ashmira Ranjit, who is a feminist artist based out of Nepal. And she runs the, uh, a space called Nexus and the Lasana Arts Trust uh, based here. The reason I'm actually bringing the three of them together is because uh, it's my interpretation of the way that I'm looking at their work and there were some common threads that I found. Um, so it's the feminist, they are the feminist voice and art practice for me. Um, and this is what some of what we will discuss um, in the next hour. Um, to give you a brief uh, introduction into the panel, um, I'll just give you a brief background on the little bit of research that I did. Um, the feminist art movement uh, emerged in the West in the late 1960s and it happened amidst parallel movements for civil and queer rights that were happening at the same time. Uh, the goal of the movement was to influence cultural attitudes and transform stereotypes. The focus was to present a message about the women's experience and the need for gender equality. I think that's what's most important to recognize here. It's, it's saying that it's the need for equality that's most important. Uh, the movement also created opportunities that didn't exist previously for women and minority artists. And this paved the way for identity and activist art in the 1980s. So with this, um, I'm going to introduce the three of them. They'll introduce their works, and then we'll get into the discussion. Uh, just to start with this name. Hi, everyone. So um, a lot of you have probably heard my voice several times now. <laughs> I'll try to be as brief as I can be. Um, I'm a photographer. I started photography only a few years ago. I studied anthropology and social linguistics, and I have a master's in studying Saudi women being interpreted by the West or how they want to be perceived also. Not really for me with photography more than a hobby, but then a few years ago I started photographing my own kids, and then soon after some people started asking me to photograph their weddings, and then here we are today. But Photographing, I think, my own family wasn't as important to me until I started realizing that a lot of people were interested and fascinated by anything Saudi. So whatever I share is amazing. But then I had to kind of um, be better than the other photographers, especially the ones based in Saudi, because I wanted to be a mediator. I was born and raised in the US. I uh, grew up between England also from the age of 6 to 16. So when I came to Saudi at the age of 16, everything was different. I was still not 100% Saudi because as my grandfather said, she's always a Westerner, she always answers back. But I'm still not 100 full. I'm not 100% American because even when I told people I was American, my mother would say, all Americans are secretly laughing at you because you're not really blonde. So I was neither. So then I had to rely on my captions. So we have a lot of struggles in Saudi, as women especially. I think even for men, but for women we have the government, we have religion, and then we also have society governing us. And with those three different things, we kind of have to maneuver our way. But amazingly enough, I think with any minority, anywhere in the world, you'll find the more obstacles that you have, the more you can fight back. So we can't drive cars, but we find ways to drive scooters and bikes. Um, when I was shooting the weddings, I also found so many things that I had access to that no one else did. Not just the amazing fantasy world that I think is very universal, but also 
stories to how they met, and sometimes they push those boundaries. Also, our weddings are segregated, which are very different than everywhere else in the world. So women celebrate in a different ballroom, sometimes even on a different day. And the men here in this band, for instance, are hiding in a room. And we share a live screen, so we dance to them. They have no idea who's dancing, what we're wearing, or how we look. But they'll sing, you know, to the left, to the left. Um, and also when the groom comes into the ballroom, some of the women, if they come from conservative backgrounds, will cover. So this is just for 10 minutes while the groom is in the ballroom for the group shots, and then he'll leave. I also realize I have access. I have something that no one else has, even other wedding photographers. So I photograph different weddings across the world. Sarkar, that's the image. That's the picture. Um, anyway. Um, so I went to shoot a wedding in Maryland, and it's an American groom marrying a, an Indian bride, and he said, what do you want? And I said, I don't know. He's like, you came all the way across the world. We have to give you something you've not seen. So I said, I want butts. And all of a sudden, he you know, asked all the groomsmen to do that for me. I didn't know that I had so much power. But they paid me to photograph this, and he hung it in his bathroom. Um, as soon as I came back to Saudi, I realized I needed to do something, again, more than just weddings. So I started photographing everything around me, my own environment. In this case, Saudi women are just asking me to come to their um, desert tent party, but it wasn't in the tent, it was a two hour drive in the middle of the desert, but then there's a huge big villa with a huge pool and they're dancing to western music. Um, also, Saudi women, we are faced with several constraints of owning a gym, for instance. So to have a gym, you have to open under a license of a hair salon or um, dressmaking factory or, uh, sorry, store or a physiotherapist. But we still managed to find our way to actually open a gym. Also, this is the second year that Saudi women were allowed to join the Olympics. So one of my characters, May, uh, May's daughter here, um, dreams to join the Olympics one day. Saudi Arabia is the only country that doesn't allow women to travel freely wherever they want without a legal male guardian. So um, in the last few years, we or our fathers and our husbands or our brothers, sons, whoever it is that is your legal male guardian, you're not allowed to get rid of that male guardian ever, um, can now go online and from his phone can allow, you know, my female, I don't know what the other word would be, um, to travel freely or from this time limit or to this country. So we always have this thing that I cannot do anything without my father's agreement or my husband's or my son. Sometimes even your stepbrother that you have never met. But there is always a legal male, a male guardian, whether you agree to him or not. This is an American restaurant where my family go to, and my mom is very happy that I'm photographing them, obviously. But all these little stalls are closed with curtains. So I had access to lots of Saudi stories that no one knows about. We are segregated in everything. Um, except for medicine, so only in hospitals or in medical school are women allowed to study alongside men. Everything else, we are separated by buildings or even at least by a wall in the middle of the mall. We don't have public beaches for women. We only have a few private beaches that you have to be very wealthy to go to. And even then, it's men who can swim there, not women. So we have to only swim in our own private pools if we have access to it. But then I went to a Western villa, or compound, sorry, housing, and there was a German woman who loves Saudi Arabia. She's been there for several years, and she goes diving every week. So then I realized that if you're not Saudi, you have different rules to conform to, and it's not the same, and that's why a lot of non-Saudis come to Saudi Arabia. So I started photographing non-Saudis, whether they were workers or expats. They have a privilege that we don't have. Um, I also started noticing things that I wouldn't have, and maybe men wouldn't have noticed those things either. For instance, this is a 13-year-old Saudi girl, and that was her home screen. I wanted to use it as a reflector. I saw that image, and I asked her, can I photograph this? Yes. So, we are very talented. <laughs> I had to photograph um, an assignment for Vogue Italia. So the Italian women came to Saudi, to Jeddah specifically, as this city to find and scout Saudi fashionistas. These women are all Saudi Arabian, but I realized one thing. 
that when it's an expat photographer or someone who's not local, we can all speak Arabic so that they wouldn't understand us. But I was Saudi, so I understood everything. And they kept telling them, don't speak about politics. Do not discuss religion with them at all. So everything was filtered. But I understand what they were doing. So I felt like, OK, I kind of know. I have a point of access that no one else has to. And then this is another selfie by Saudi women also. And you can see the difference in how they wear and which city they're from or which age. But I had to also remove this image after posting it in a few hours because these are 13-year-olds, and one of them wasn't covered, even though I specifically asked them, can I photograph all of you? Yes. But she only she didn't know that I was going to use it on social media, so if her father found out, he would not allow her to go to anywhere other than school. So I had to, for my own consciousness, and obviously for hers, to remove that image. This is the same event that they had in the selfie picture. Um, and it's. I also wanted to share that Saudi men sometimes want to promote the embedderment of Saudi women. I photograph a lot of Saudi women stories because I feel like I have more access to them. But there are many men out there who are promoting, you know, they want to help, they want to, they don't want to drive us around everywhere. They don't want to sign everything, every bank account that we open or every university class that we add. And then I started this project. I got accepted by Magnum Foundation and they wanted me to, um, because my project was a Saudi photographer who is a wedding photographer and wants to study how the reality ever after begins. <coughs> and no one would allow me to photograph them except for Ranin and Hisham because this was their second marriage and it was to each other. So because it wasn't a very negative view, they allowed me. Everyone else didn't. And I had to photograph and rely on my grandmother and my daughter initially. And then slowly, people started coming up and saying, OK, we're, we're OK with it. So I started photographing different stories, like Ghadia, for instance, who has not been married. And she's in her you know, early 30s now. And if anyone asks her why, she says, I'm married to my job. She has 60 to 70 men working for her. May, who is a widow, um, fell in love with her university colleague because she's in dentistry where women and men can mix. But he died the day before he signed the lease of them buying a house, which means she has to pay for the full house. Um, but until her son, who is now 14, becomes 16, her legal guardian is her stepbrother that she hasn't met. And then I started working on the collaborative portraits. Instead of just photographing documentary, let me ask you, how do you want to be interpreted around love and marriage and divorce? So for Ahud, for instance, she's been divorced twice. Her only liberation and freedom is when she's diving underwater. And I just felt that that was a very strong portrait that I need to share with the world. When you're hiding and no one can see you, that's when you're free. But also they have this sense of independence. Saudi women are not allowed to marry, or not encouraged to marry a non-Saudi. It's very difficult. But in some cases, like Afra, she decided to marry a Yemeni, which means that her son will never be a Saudi, and he will not have free access to education or health care. National Geographic last year um, assigned me a story about the women, Saudi women, um, and joining the municipality elections. And initially, it was not a story that I was very interested in. But the editor was very encouraging in allowing me to pursue what I thought was the reality, the truth, which was women did not care. We really didn't care if this happened or not because men didn't even care. And they asked me to photograph this story for three to four days. I couldn't really find a lot of things to photograph. Nothing was happening. No one in their 30s or even early 40s or 20s even went to vote. And there were so many hurdles to, for us as Saudi women to vote. Why would we care about electing a woman or a man to choose which color pavement if we can't drive on that street? But then I had to shift and instead of shooting document, sorry, documentary, yeah, I started shooting in portraits. So it made me shift even my perception of photography. Another thing is I realized whenever I told them I'm, pho I'm a photographer from National Geographic, all these women started lying and making up stories just to impress me. We don't want the West to know that we are stupid. We are very smart. I'm like, OK, but the reality is you're not doing anything. So I also have a job that I want to tell the truth. And I might not have that access if I wasn't a local. Um, same thing here with Saudi women. There was an explosion at a mosque a year ago by ISIS. And I, as a woman, would not be allowed to photograph the 700 men that were saved. or 
the thousands of men that went to their funeral service, but then I wanted to photograph the mother who lost her two sons and her nephew and their best friend. So again, I have access as a woman that no one else has. Maysa was um, arrested a few years ago for driving a car in 2013 when there was a revolutionary movement for about a day and all the women were arrested, but she was in prison and for a few months until the previous king died, so they let out the woman. Um, she was in prison because she was 31 in a different section where her friend was in the same car because the other girl was 25 and women under 30 are juveniles. I want to just wrap this up by saying that as a wedding photographer, I kind of try to ask a lot of questions about gender issues and society and why we have so many things to conform by society, religion, government, and how is it that we can maneuver things. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much. All the presentations and then then get into the discussion. Hello, everyone. Um, you can see the drawing over there is actually coming from the word woman, which is middle part of the drawing. So you can see the matches. In, in the middle of that one. And they are actually talking about the women, like the match box and the matches sticks. When it, you know, you just uh, touch it, then it burns. So this is, um, uh, I'm from such a country where there are like a lot of things happening. <coughs> so it's not exactly like the same situation, but um, you know, there are still there are like arranged marriage and all these things. So this is a uh, very old work of mine. I think it's from 2010. And uh, I uh, just uh, uh, hearing a lot of stories from friends about the, their um, uh, they they look happily married, but in the end of the day, you know that they are not happily married at all. So. Um, in the end, I thought that why don't we marry ourselves, you know, um, instead of marrying a man. So I call it, I bet myself, and that's me, uh, you know, staging myself. Can I just put the video? Yeah, a little bit of video. <coughs> so it looks a very funny video, but uh, it's not funny actually. <laughs> It's a three minutes video, but that's uh, the view you can just see. Slowly. Yeah, then you see that, you know, the, I'm just the same day when I was shooting the whole thing, I had my hair cut also. And then I was uh, played the both role of uh, the groom and bride.
So the interesting part is the man is actually uh, helping me to put the makeup and all those things. <laughs> and it's a corner piece, like two videos, it's two channel video for two minutes. <laughs> and I, I felt a little bit naughty while I was, you know, dressed up as a groom <laughs> to look at the bride. <laughs> okay. So um, then, you know, I, I'm, my background is painting, but I was already always interested about creating something. That actually coming from my husband, you have already met him, Mabubu Rahman. So um, we are happily married for a long time, don't worry about it. <laughs> so, um, and while I was a very, very hardcore painting, it was him actually who was exploring a lot of things and who encouraged me to do, use a lot of other materials. So I did a uh, residency in Pakistan in 2008. That time we were having the similar kind of situation, political situation, Bangladesh and Pakistan. We are very, you know, similar to each other, <laughs> although we fought. Um, anyway, then I found that there are like, uh, uh, the army government in both countries. We had shadowed army government. And then we were in a situation, we, we found that a lot of our friends were arrested and we, we have no clue about them also, whether they, you know, when, they, when they're coming back home as well. So in that kind of situation, I started finding something very sharp and shiny for my work. So in Pakistan, I started working with, I, uh, all of a sudden in the uh, in a local market, I found the uh, radio plate. And I was thinking that why I am just taking this material. It's actually coming from uh, my childhood also, my, it's related to me, as uh, I'm from a very, very small, um, you can say it's a village from Bangladesh, it's in countryside. And in that area, maybe still now also, like in the remote areas, not in that town anymore, but um, uh, children were born, uh, like they were separated when the mother was delivering. No, they were, they were usually used to like, uh, you know, separate the midwife, used to separate the child from the mother with the only one tool, which is a ratio. So that came to my mind uh, uh, from my childhood because I accidentally, I saw once of my cousins, uh, like before she was born, I saw the situation. So it was a big question for me all the times, like, you know, why my brothers, because I have, I am from a very large family, I'm number 11 from 12. <laughs> and only one parent, like, you know, uh, not many mothers. Of <laughs> so, um, I have seen my uh, nephews and nieces, they were born in front of me and then I found that every time my brothers are uh, running to the shop to get a uh, new razor blade and uh, the midwife is boiling it in water to just you know, uh, make it uh, uh, hygienic. Anyway, then you know, I started, I was thinking about uh, like, I was not happy with the uh, uh, blades that were found in the market because uh, you cannot bend them, you cannot make any form out of them. So I, uh, with my very special uh, partner, uh, you know, I was suggested to make them with uh, uh, stainless steel, which I can bend actually. So I started uh, fabricating them. So that's my uh, first ever like piece with the uh, you know the fabricated razor blades. I call it Bijar and the Beautiful. And here we come is the detail of Bijar and the Beautiful. It's really beautiful <laughs> to look at. <laughs> and then uh, here come my love bed. So I uh, the middle part is created. Uh, by the uh, found, uh, like uh, uh, the ready-made plates that I found in the market. And the other parts are uh, with the fabricated one. And I call it Love Bed, and I showed it for the first time in Hakkar Summit, the first edition. 
And that time I found that it worked actually. There was a couple, they didn't know me, who am I? I was standing behind them. And the lady, the uh, woman, the wife was saying to the husband that, this is for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was something I really t I wanted to record that, but I couldn't. <laughs> so that was, you know, something coming out of, uh, like, you know, that kind of, a uh, lot of friends of mine also, they have, um, like very happily married life, but actually they maybe don't really hug each other for a long time in one bed. So that love bed coming yeah. from in response to that uh, kind of uh, life as life. So here the love bed is again. And then um, I have a lot of a story about myself also in my many of my works I put myself inside it. And uh, very often also I stage myself for my videos. But um, this is a very personal work that I did, uh, which I call my daughter's court. We don't have children, but um, I feel like it's my daughter's court. And I didn't choose my son's court. I, it sounds like, you know, I always maybe wanted a daughter. And, um, there is a, when Tasneem was talking about her stories, I was thinking about my story. In Bangladesh also, we have very nice image, and many of them are there. But you only can go, you, you, you are allowed to swim there as women also, but you have to do proper clothing, you know. You cannot go with the bikinis. But I love them, you know. Whenever I go to the West, to Europe, I buy them. They were both. So this is, <laughs> this is my comfy bikinis coming out of it and they are made out of septic pins and these septic pins are also duplicated. And this is also a very sharp, tiny, tiny thing, you know, uh, because from my childhood whenever you know, I turned my buttons and all these things while playing, I always had to make sure that there is a septic pin in my clothes so that I can just, you know, make it uh, over. and then. These safety pins are also made out of stain, uh, sorry, um, uh, metal, and then you know they are. Uh, and this is my nighty also. I always think that I will have a good nighty to wear, but we never had a fancy life like that. I always go with the work that I mean the the dress and take my working dress or my home dress to my bed. So, but this is like a dream. <laughs> And my shoes here, I call it uh, Miles After Miles. Uh, they are from different, uh, you know, uh, brand. I like to, I always say that, you know, I'm branding myself. Um, so this is like um, my own shoes. And I just uh, try to, um, I, I really like them because I have been wearing them for a long, long time. So every time, you know, I, think about doing something new, I look at my own things, you know, whichever is just close to me. So maybe that time it clicked uh, from my shoe uh, uh, thing like that uh, uh, case or something. And then this actually, this is the copper wires. Uh, they look like, um, uh, you know, the hair. And the first one I did, well, I did a project with a um, uh, transgender person. I'm grateful to her to give me all the like opportunity to work with her for such a long time. So I started working with her in 2012 for one um, uh, exhibition that Mabu curated, cross casting, which is like cross gender casting, that was uh, organized at Brito in 2013. So that was the first time I, uh, I did, I, I will show the project later. But that, uh, those, uh, actually those uh, weeks, I um, went through some of their houses, transgender houses, they always have, they're worried about their hair and skin. So I found there are lots of wigs actually in her room also. And she was asking me, do you want my wigs? I said, no, no, I'll make them. So I made, made that copper wigs. Um, in response to, you know, her um, own wigs. And uh, this I call end of the story. I am almost like I am about 48 years old, so 
you know, the age and all these things are happening in your life, like, you know, when you give up many other things in your life, when you are, are about to be 50. Um, so I gave up from 40. So, <laughs> so these are like, you can, uh, if you closely look at them, it's, uh, they are the sanitary napkins and they are small sanitary napkins that we use. And um, they are joined uh, with uh, small wear also. So I call it the uh, end of the story. It looks like a love sign, but it's not love. You don't love it, no? So anyway. <laughs> And sometimes we are too busy, we, we really don't have time, the world is too crazy, too, like everyone has, like have, have, has had to have their own position, and all this like internet and everything is making everyone so crazy that you don't have time to take rest. So sometimes I feel, I, 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 we don't have a bathtub, maybe we'll have later, but <laughs> I always think that, oh, if I have a bathtub, I could have, you know, um, just, you know, sit there for a long time and I could have enjoyed my bathtub. So this is like, let's take a break um, for me. And this is my mother's dressing table that I uh, uh, kind of, uh, like, um, uh, followed that design. And it, it had a story, my mother bought it, uh, my father bought it from his British uh, boss when they were leaving uh, uh, this Indian subcontinent. And my mother used to use that one for a long time. In my childhood also I used that one. So it was like a, a big uh, connection with my mother. And after my mother's death, I didn't take anything except for one sari that she was wearing last time. And then after many years, when my father died, I asked my brother to send this dressing, dressing table to me. So this is the dress up for my mother that he did. And this is actually um, also like a, I was connected with, with my mother uh, in the, when she was like, when she was, uh, uh, she, she died in 1997. Before that, she was very ill for a long time. And then she had to uh, sit on a, uh, what it was, um, the wheelchair all the times. So that's a big memory for me also. But one day there was this Gaja war and all this, and I was watching uh, BBC and CNN and all this. and I. I saw, you know, the, they were showing the hospital, there was no room, everyone was on the floor, and there is a row of uh, wheelchairs, so they looked like that. So I just connected the whole thing together with uh, my personal memory, so it's coming from there. And this is like, hey, there's no way to say goodbye. It's actually from a book. One thing, we have a bed for the last 20 years. It's a small single bed, you can't believe how small that one. And um, uh, one day we were sitting uh, on our bed and then talking. And then we were talking about like, you know, we are together for such a long time because we studied together and then we fell in love with each other. And then we had a long journey together also almost 25 years, more than I think, 26 years. So then one day he was telling that, you know, if, who is living first? Who is living the world first? Then I just, you know, uh, that time Leonard Cohen was singing this, hey, there's no way to say goodbye. So I felt like this. I said that it would be very tough for one of us to, you know, be alive without another. So that's there. And then uh, the transgender's um, uh, work that uh, Anunna. I um, did this video for the first time with her. Then uh, can you go for the video a little bit? Yeah. <coughs> I should have done what the children did. Show us that we made it up to you. 
So when she is talking about her own experience and her own life, I was actually digging a grave for my start because I felt really guilty that I never had any interest about their life and why they are alienated in the society. And I agreed with that in my whole life, that they are aliens. And somehow it happened in my life and then before I met her, I never realized how hard could be someone's life. Although we are from like similar age group, but she was going through all this you know, hardship, and I was having a very, very relaxed, you know, sense life in village. So that's how, that's why I made this video. You know. So it's a seven minutes long two channel video, and she used to tell all her time that uh, we uh, like to uh, put all the colors on us, but I am, we, we have no color. We, we, our life is black and white. So I just tried to make everything black and white. So that's my grey beard. I'm making it by myself. Anunna is talking about her life. Yeah, and they just end her. Then actually, I thought that I'm not a documentary filmmaker. I am not interested about uh, you know talking about their rights because they are very also. Um, aggressive about their own uh, rights and everything and they feel that they're enough but they always think that we should support them at least moral support and then I went through her personal things I said that Anona I want to extend the project with you so can I have some uh, toys from your life and she said she doesn't have any toy because they have to leave their own house when they're child to their own community and they forcefully go to, uh, to uh, no. it's not their choice, they have no uh, choice, it's, they're not going willingly. It's like family is forcing them also to go out of the house. And then I said that what actually you have done. And she said that I love bags, I love this, I love that. And then she had her very favorite bag and shoes. They are very long shoes. She's like a man, she's very tall and all. So I uh, just tried to um, make you know, uh, those bags and uh, shoes. And then I had a show at the Shrine Empire Gallery in Delhi in 2013. It was a project called Reversal Reality. And this is uh, Anona and me. I, I t always try to compare her and my life and you know, just trying to synchronize both of us together. She is a great dancer and I used to sing in my childhood. So I sang a song and she danced with my song. So the uh, sound is there with these uh, this two faces. And I collected her childhood uh, photographs. Which she, they had to, like, she had to move from one place to another so many times that she doesn't have any you know, other things in her life from her childhood or from her family. Mm -hmm. So I just tried to make sure that I'm putting my work, uh, my uh, life and her life while we were together with the families. So uh, I created all these light boxes in the gallery. There were a series of photographs there. And then, you know, there is a very personal project. I never showed it publicly, uh, like uh, never did a presentation publicly. I did the project for Dhaka Summit in 2014. And I call it a room of my own. And I, um, uh, as I told you before, so that I had, a, like, we don't have children, and I had a very bad um, kind of, um, uh, how do you call it? Miscarriage, yeah. So um, uh, that time, uh, you know, after that, we really gave up because I was uh, in a really, really bad condition. and. Uh, uh, Mabuk didn't want me to, you know, do it again, try it again. But I made a like little journey on, on my own. So I was trying to like find out uh, this, like, uh, if it is possible or not or what. We didn't think about it for a long time. So after the miscarriage, I was like, oh, really? So I have to go for it. So I, I made that uh, like you know little. Uh, 
try for with uh, uh, some uh, doctors and all. And then I have I have done a lot of tests and all this. And after that miscarriage, actually, I felt that my body was not in the good shape. But anyway, that um, that time there were like a lot of uh, ultrasounds and the series of ultrasounds um, I did. And um, I just installed them in my room. And there are like uh, children's uh, clothing and there's the home. And finally, it's like there is no blood actually. You are going for this thing, but there is no blood. It's full stop here. So thank you very much. While technically going on, I'll just say um, Namaste and those who are from outside of Nepal, welcome and whoever have been here, uh, I hope you all enjoyed and big kudos to Naintara um, and um, it is the most wonderful event that she could manage to put it together. It's Naintara is our pride and also the whole team. No? That's it. Whatever she has done is just wonderful. You know, it's, I don't have other words how to really uh, say. Yeah. And also the whole team. And thanks. <laughs> When we were talking yesterday, day before yesterday, like it's really short time, 10 minutes is what can we present. And then I was really thinking, okay, last 27 years of whole body of work, how do you put in and how can you really bring it? And Vivian, uh, myself, has been friend for a year from 2000, no, uh, 94, uh, so we have been known each other, work with each other, you know, like so many things. So just being her with here is another pleasure. And uh, so I really thought, uh, I just put like several of work, it kind of gives like um, something bringing the voice and also, uh, I mean, every work is kind of a voice, but still. And also like how personal became a political. It's kind of like I chose this seven, eight, nine uh, work. And I thought I'll just tell my personal story and then start. So there are a few things in uh, when I was a kid, I don't know, I, I was really um, a kid. I think f when I was five years old, I first came to know I have a name, you know, that is Ashmina. Before then, I mean, uh, my nickname is Maya. In Nepal, everyone calls a girl child Maya and Babu for the boys, you know. So it's like, it's like very common. And then one incident, like one postman came and my grandfather said, hey Maya, go and get the letter from the <coughs> door, you know, downstairs. And I went and as a kid, you know, five years old, what do you do? You just look up the 
in Vallabha, and I was just like playing with that, never went upstairs. So my grandfather called me, Maya, Maya, two or three times, and then suddenly he called me, Ashmina, come up, you know, and then I just like, I, I thought that is so beautiful. And then I just went upstairs, and who you were calling, and then say, well, your name is Ashmina. Then I thought it was beautiful. I loved my name. <laughs> and the other incident, uh, when I was about six, seven, you know, that young age, uh, we used to have a, a nanny um, who used to cook and actually look after me. And I used to look outside of the window and then <clears throat> always enjoy looking at clouds. It's safe and just the free how it was about the sky, you know. And then, but my nanny used to say, hey, don't look at the clouds. And I used to wonder why, you know. I, I, I always ask questions and they said, being a girl, you should not be watching the cloud. If you watch the cloud, you would be uh, wanting to fly and women can't go that way, you know. So don't watch. But anyway, I did all the time. So that was another thing. And then another question that really bothered me always, like when we are like really growing up, everybody always said there is always an idle person. Like you have to be like that. And for example, Sita as a woman, you know, that character from mythology is one thing. And also they always ask, when you grow up, like whom you want to be? And I always really wonder about that question. Is this really a question? Like, what does it really mean? Why should be I would be like someone else? I would like to be me, you know? That's the kind of really that things were there. And other few incidents, when we were growing up in the school, like um, um, I went to girls' school, and then the teachers, you know, like some of the teachers would be really kind of harassing kind of teacher, you know, as you are in the adolescence year, and the teacher would come and touch you like that, you know, like in your body, which is like really, nobody really wanted that touch, but people really touched that. And then some girls really felt bad and some girls really could not do anything. And then one point, uh, I got into that really extreme level. He was touching someone. But I just shouted on that teacher, like really, you know, I just started swearing on him, like God knows whatever that swearing came from. And everyone was shocked and then like looking at me and then that teacher started really fighting with me, like verbally, of course. Say, oh, you'll be rusticated. Look, okay, go and go to hell, whatever you want to do to it, you know, I just don't care. It. Why, the, why the hell you touch the, you know, if the girl doesn't want. So that kind of thing. In a way, I always stood for, and I always questioned. And also, being a girl, do this, do, don't do that, is always the kind of on your plate. And I always asked about that. And then, uh, by default, I would say, because, um, and also one, one of the things I would like to say, because while watching the cloud, my nanny used to say not to watch the cloud, and I always thought I wanted to really fly there because they are saying no to it, you know. And then as a kid, my nanny thought well, maybe I should become a pilot and then I can fly always, you know, all these people. And then later on I realized my wanting to fly is not really about the physical flight, but to be who I am and also to be a voice for who is not really being who they are, and also really the freedom. Uh, so in that sense, and then once I went to art school, uh, for, for a few, first few years it was very okay, because my father is also art, an artist, he really supported, but at one point, once you have skill and all these things, then it's kind of like you started looking at yourself from all these, from the very childhood 
things, what you have experienced, you know. And then, like, my personal story started coming up. And then I started really talking about, then realized, okay, this personal is, my personal story is not only my personal, but it's everyone's else. So it became, like, political. And, yeah, that's how it, I really started. And uh, this skeleton I have been carrying, um, um, since last December 9th, and that was the day, it was 80, 81st day after the prolongation, prom, promulgation of that um, constitution, and we have been fighting for women's rights for a really long time. And then, um, and of course, on the course, we got so many things, so many rights, it seems like. But at the same time, uh, the very basic thing, what you really need, what you, what you, it makes you really core of this country, you know, like the part of country, it's not there. You can't really pass on to your citizenship to your children from your, I mean, through your name, you know. There has to be man. If it is for the man, then he can go and marry anywhere, anyone from anywhere, or, and he can, or his children can be the Nepali citizen. Whereas for women, um, unless the man is Nepali, then you can't really pass on to it. In that sense, women are stateless, and women always depending on these things, you know, like thing called man. So. That's what one of the things. And also, while I was trying to, maybe one or two work, I'll just talk about a little bit. You know, maybe the menstruation. When, uh, I mean, in our panel, um, it happened to be two of our friends uh, happened to be from Muslim uh, background. I mean, whether they, practice that or not, that's definitely, definitely different. And I happen to be from Hindu Buddhist background. And in Hinduism especially, you know, like, um, or in Nepali, how it is practiced is when you became, when you are having a period, you become untouchable. You basically a, a lesser human, lesser being. And then uh, I started really questioning about, since the very, first time. I, I never followed that thing. And I always thought it is the you know, uh, most wonderful thing that happens in the life. And if it comes to stand still, no life could go further, you know, come to the standstill. So it should be actually celebrated rather than uh, really uh, taken as negatively how it is taken. So I, I have done so many of work in that performance installation, blah, blah, blah. One of these is uh, the performance I did uh, in 2008 or nine. I can't remember exactly the date. And I made a dress uh, out of sanitary towel, and then I just calculated, you know, how many, uh, in average, one woman, how many sanitary, sanitary pad uses in her life, you know, if average, from 12 years to 45 years, then uh, uh, that would be 33 years into 13 times a year. 28 days is like 30, uh, yeah, 13 times into four days into five pad in average. So it is 8,000 plus something number. So I made dress out of that and then wore that and perform in the public. And every second, I'll be talking, doing all the normal things, hugging people, eating, drinking, all these things. And then, but at the same time, every moment I'll be bleeding, and then take it safely and put it outside. You know uh, that. And I really wanted to do that piece once in the one of the first, actually, uh, I think festival or that rituals happens here when women. Once a year, one of the day, it is called Rishi Panchami, where women go and clean themselves for 365 times, saying 
I must have done some scene because I'm a woman and I played at that time. So just to clean up their scene, they just clean up, you know, Hindu women. So I wanted to do that perform, but every time something happened, I just could not do that didn't happen. And uh, this is very recent work. Um, uh, collaborated with uh, 22 adolescents and then two other uh, artists, like they kind of came up together to create this dress. It's on adolescents, child marriage is another thing, you know, and also it's really how the women's body became objective, um, but women's body objectified into the sexual object and how. Um, um, they can uh, used in different um, politically incorrect way. Let's say that uh, more than other things. So there there are other works. I mean, I think I would come to because as I'm looking at the time, so I'm, I think it's really this. So we can talk more further. <coughs> and yeah, thank you. for giving us such different perspectives in all three of your works. Um, I'd like to ask all three of you, um, in the context of feminism, because the fight for feminism came out of a need for gender equality. Um, and the first wave of feminism, which started around the mid-19th century, began with the women's suffrage movement uh, in the US. Now, uh, many artworks that at that time dealt with the body or personal experience or ideas of domesticity were later terms and termed as feminist. So when I was uh, looking at the three of your works, I mean, for me, the sneem yours is about personal experience. Yours, if you look at Lockbed, then it's ideas of domesticity. And uh, if I look at yours, then uh, it focuses on body and body politics. How do the three of you position your works as uh, within the feminism? <coughs> For me, I, I mean, um, the term feminism, feminist, is taken very negatively most of the time, saying, okay, being feminist means you are a man hater. No, I love men, you know. <laughs> really. Uh, so it's not about man hating, it's about like the um, equality. Uh, Kind of, you know, really, it's really about like treated equally to the, all the human beings, you know, not about like sexist kind of uh, uh, society we are talking about. And you, from my personal story, you must have you must have really realized like my base of all my work is really from that political viewpoint. It comes from that, and so I I. I identify myself as a feminist artist. There is no problem about that. And also sometimes, um, uh, I mean, definitely few feminist art, uh, feminist, I mean, I identify as that, but, but at the same time, I, I think I'm a humanist, you know? No matter what, what happens to others, whether it's a man or that man or woman, if there is some injustice things is happening, I stand for that, you know. So in that sense, I really believe on hum equal human rights, you know, and that has to be there. And then if we look at our society, all of ours, you know, society, where women is seen as, you know, in mythological perspective, they were always put up there, you know, like all these babies and goddesses and all these things. But when it comes to reality, the way they treat it, you know, as a sexual object, nothing more. You don't have brain, you know. Beauty and brain doesn't go together. All these bullshits, you know. So it it doesn't work in that sense, you know. And now we have to really come to the point where it is equal. And also people question one more thing, you know. When they, men and women are never equal. Of course they are never equal. We three are very different. Look at us, you know. So how can we men and women or someone? No individual is same or similar. I mean, it's kind of like different. So even though there are different between men, they have opportunities. And just because being you born as a woman, and if you don't have that thing, then, you know, what do you say? 
that's how my take on this. I know uh, you have different takes. So. Okay. It's very, um, I mean, Ashmina, is, she's very strong. I know her for a long time. I know. <laughs> um, mine is, uh, I don't know actually, a lot of people put me in that box uh, many times. But many of my works actually talk about, you know, different things at the same time. So I can't, I can't or don't claim myself as a feminist artist, mm -hmm. but um, if people put me in it, I don't mind, it's okay. But uh, I always uh, think that why I really like, because I, in my uh, paintings also, when I was a student and afterwards uh, my career, uh, in the beginning of my career, I used to work with only female bodies all the time. So I was thinking that why I do it. Actually, I know women better than a man, although I sleep with him for so many years. <laughs> and um, men are still, you know, they are mysterious to me. So I can connect uh, with the women very easily. I just, I can talk to this name or talk to Ashmina for five minutes and I know who is she. But I don't understand man maybe. So, <laughs> so, you know, I don't mind if somebody put me in. What actually um, intrigued me about your I Wear Myself piece, uh, because recently I saw this show on cross-dressing, and uh, in the 1920s there was this movement within feminism where uh, women were trying to get away from this uh, stifling idea of femininity, so they were expected to wear these like bone-crushing corsets and bustiers and like high collars, large hats. So to get away from this I this hyper-feminine idea, they started to work, and this was the, this was 1920s in the US. So they went out to work, started occupying public spaces, and also started dressing up as men. Um, so the whole they were who were termed as the tomboys or the new women of the 20s. So when I actually looked at your work, that came back to me, and I was interested in knowing that you know you make your own gender quite fluid in that sense uh, because you're also the groom and you're also the bride. So uh, why did you not uh, get a male artist to? to perform that role and how was that experience for you? Because I titled my work before I created the work. I said that I weighed myself, so I thought, okay, it should be me actually, playing the both roles. So, you know, there is no problem, you are happy with yourself, you be at your place, your own place, you know, you don't have to deal with another man all your life or fight. So, you know, all these things are actually not coming from my own experience. It's there are, many of them are coming from my friend's experience or my family's experience. Mm -hmm. So that you know I went through the process. <coughs> okay, I try to act maybe like a groom, you know, if I I think I look uh, better <laughs> <laughs> But do you uh, do you feel that gender roles are quite fluid or uh, within the societies? Yes, of course, because you know why, because we have so many, you know that I am working with transgenders. We have so many gay friends. I don't have many lesbian friends, maybe they are afraid of me. But uh, yeah, I have many gay friends also. So, uh, uh, yeah, there, you're right too. Um, with this theme, uh, I was wondering, like, your, your whole narrative in Saudi Tales of Love is uh, through the eyes of the women. And there is a certain kind of access that you get, being a woman, and how deeply uh, you are that you know you can connect with women quite easily. But um, yes, can I just add one thing? I am not Lippy Appa. Appa means big sister, elder sister. <laughs> <laughs> so don't call me if you want. Don't start calling me Appa, please. <laughs> um, so somewhere there, I mean, I I wonder what the men are thinking, um, and where's that side of the story. So it's interesting because I, I show all my stories and my work uh, before it was published to my father and I sit with him and I read all the captions and he kind of went quiet. He's like, I don't, I don't feel comfortable because none of the men are amazing. You only show one man and I'm amazing and I love you and I've been good to you. I've never done anything. I'm not, I've been supporting and he did it with such a sad tone. Like he felt like I'm, why am I not one of the men in your story? Um, and it took me a, a while back 
to kind of realize I genuinely respect my father and he's been a great support. So is my my brother and my grandfather who, you know, I talk about in my project too. But I feel that if if I talk about men, then I'm, I won't change things as much as I change. I tell our story because men don't really need any changes in Saudi Arabia. They already have a lot of access to ed freedoms of everything. They have the society, the culture. Every religious rule is supporting men, even though I'm, I pride myself on saying that I'm Muslim, whether I practice everything. But I, I genuinely love Islam because Islam as a religion, not the practice by Muslims, not the Muslims, but it promotes a lot for women. And it's one of the religions that is the first to promote divorce rights and you know female rights. It's, it actually talks a lot about activist women at the time of the Prophet who were you know, warriors, and they joined the army, and they were uh, doctors, supporters, and so many things. So they did that. How, why am I not being able to have any access, you know, 1,500 years later? So I think that I would call myself an activist, a human, you know, equalist. But I don't know if I want to say a feminist, because I don't want to say that I'm superior to men. I feel that we're equal, and we both have our own strengths and weaknesses, and we can collaborate and make an amazing household of whatever we want. But another thing is, when I did my thesis, I remember for my master's, everyone was asking, so how do you guys, like, what's your marriage like? I bet the man is the master and the woman is the slave. Um, our households are very different. Not every household is the same. So where in the Western world, they might be counterparts. So both men and women will go work. They will both cook. They will both clean. Um, maybe in the Middle East, it's a little bit different where they both now work. My mother is a professor at university, and my aunts are lawyers or you know doctors. But my father will be the one who buys everything from the grocery store, and my mother is the one who cooks. So they complement each other differently. And I think that speaks out in um, for you, I was wondering that um, it, there's this one argument that says that feminist artists have incorporated alternative media in their works, like fabric or performance and video, uh, in a way also because they don't carry the same male-dominated precedence, like painting and sculpture, because they have a, this long uh, dominance with male artists. Um, and during the beginning of the movement, the use of these non-traditional media also sought to expand the definition of fine arts and include a wider variety of artistic perspectives. Now with the kind of work that you're doing, uh, you're uh, using a lot of performance to look at sexuality, identity, and politics. Um, and I see that the work may not necessarily be guided by aesthetic concerns, but more to create a reaction in the viewer and uh, to create a sense of unease. So how difficult it is, uh, is it to uh, do that work in Nepal and to do the performance piece out in the public? What are the reactions? Yeah. Uh, for media, I mean, I started as a painter, you know, and sculptor. I I use any medium. Still, I do use. It, it depends on what my concept is and how I'm trying to really express that. So sometimes here is my kind of you know medium. So sometimes, so it's not really looking from that perspective, but whatever concept demands, I just use that. And then, um, like public reactions and all these things, especially talking about sexuality in the Nepal context, it seems like so open now. But when I started really talking about sexuality, bringing that out into the um, public, simply you level as a whore. This directly they say you are a whore because you are sleeping with. Like, you know, you've been to West and you, you must have been doing all the things that is you are sleeping and having sex. That's why you are working about sexuality, you know. Mm -hmm. And then some people at the beginning when I started uh, talking about sexuality, it was like 98 <coughs> around that time. And then uh, literally actually no one has talked, women I'm talking about, literally read it in the loud voice about the sexuality and come out. Of course, some literature were there. And then um, then that was the reaction. Okay, you put it as a core, and then also um, anyone, many things, okay, I can come and just sleep with you. That's another thing. And 
you know. It's, it's really like that. And some people say, maybe you are better off going to back to your Australia or wherever, you know. It, it, it just doesn't suit here, kind of thing. That kind of thing. But um, so many times people talk behind. They don't come up to the, your front, you know, say your face. But if someone comes to my face, I mean, come in front of me and say something, then I have answered. And I'm very boldly, I always even like, I know what I'm doing. And who the hell you are to really, you know, give me a certificate whether what kind of character I can carry, you know. And also in the, I mean, it's not only here, but the whole South Asian context, if you look at and in the West as well, you know. If women, men can't really compete with here to here, you know, and then they start like, they start really putting, pointing on to your character. And when people, because character, women have so much burden of that character onto their soldier. Your father's Izzat is gone. Your, you know, family's Izzat is gone if you do that. So it's kind of really protected and controlled in that sense, you know. And so if someone's character is less, our blue fallen woman, then she's nowhere. You know, and then so many women have done suicide because they were put in that character less or, you know, kind of thing. And that kind of came to me so many times. But I said, hey, who the hell you are, you know? Do you know what I do? It's me, you know, what else? So I kind of confronted that way. And also that's why I think my work also started confronting in that context to really onto the face. You know, and so many of work, like, I, it, I, again, it really depends, like, if I need, like, some of that very fine aesthetic kind of thing, I try to bring. Sometimes if I don't think aesthetic is more important, but it, it really depends on that kind of thing. Yeah. And also one of the things, you know, fighting with others is very easy, you know. Uh, fighting with your neighbor or fighting with your stranger is very easy. But when you have to fight with your own family, your own, you know, um, brother, sister, father, it would be, it is the worst situation. And when I did uh, that sexuality series, in artist whole community, they start saying, oh, look at Ashmina, she's coming from Australia and she's doing sexuality, you know. She's, you know, like that kind of thing. And all the things that is going into my father's ear as well, mm -hmm. who supported me like whatever, you know, before. Then he started thinking about maybe you are, you know, you never know. That doubt started. Then my, I started having cold war, cold war with my father, which is not easy, mm -hmm. you know. It's like you are sleeping, you, your ground is slip off your, you know, kind of, there is no ground to really kind of mm -hmm. stand. But what I said, if I do something wrong, I would say sorry. If I have done something, I mean, I haven't done anything wrong, I would never say sorry to no matter who the hell they are, you know, standing. So in that sense, I really left my home. And in, in our context, living, now it became easier. But like 25 years, 20 years ago, it's not easy, you know. I just left home. That became another bombardment. It's like all the time that push and pull was really there. And then after a certain time, uh, my, then my father started with it. But uh, I, mean, I mean, they have changed so much now, you know, and it's, it's totally different. But it took me so long and I have paid so much for that. Mm -hmm. And that's how the whole thing. And one interesting, sorry, I'm going on and on. One interesting thing I would definitely like to share. Uh, people were, when I had exhibit here, people were saying, you know, oh, you have gone there, that's why you are doing that, you know, it's not appropriate for here, you know. And then uh, one, once, like I think 98, around 98, I think, uh, I was in Australia and the ABC radio actually interviewed me when I had sold there. And then uh, this person asked me, Oh, you could do this work, you are so, so bold, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I said, really? I mean, in the West, people are doing in our context, it's hard, you know. And they said, no, 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 you are so bold, how could you do that? And she answered herself before me, you know. 
and said, maybe, you know, you are from this Asia, Indian continent, where Kama Sutra kind of, you know, literature came. So it must be very easy for you. See me your you know, like, Come on, hang on, you know. It's kind of, and then, but that kind of thing really gave me the uh, kind of, you know, insight in a way. Well, I thought I was working about Nepal, you know, South Asia, our continent, but it's everywhere. It's a universal thing. I'm not dealing with one single, you know, Nepali or my story. It's a whole universal story. Which is something that you found with your work as well, the receptiveness of the women here and how they react to your work. I'm curious, have you shown this work in Sullivan? Um, yeah. Um, so I shared it, first of all, with the people that I photographed, and I wanted their blessings because I didn't want any of them to sue me or complain or do anything. And the amazing thing happened was that I videoed, I video Skyped each one, and there were lots of tears involved. A lot of them started saying, we never knew that there was more of us out there. I felt alone, isolated when I was going, when her husband died, for instance, or when everyone was getting divorced her second time. They all felt alone, and that, as a project, made them feel together. Um, and then I started getting emails when it was published on Time from Saudi men. And they were emailing me saying, thank you for sharing that, because your involvement and those women's stories have made us realize how much access and not access, sorry, superiority we have, how much power we have just being a man in Saudi Arabia. They have everything. They have privilege to just exist. So to me it meant more that I have emails or thank you notes from the Saudi men because I'm hoping that will change the way that they now react with like their female um, relatives. And one thing, like what you were asking, how the reaction about performance and all the things, because I am I never stop and I'm kind of experimenting all the time in mediums and also like the boundaries, you know, how I kind of delete that or merge that kind of uh, things, like where uh, uh, audience became a performer in that context. So uh, audience, like how they reacted is like they kind of really became a part of it and they start really some of the uh, some of the performance when I was doing here literally they were holding me and the last one I did that in the US uh, after like performance as I was going after like part of the performance I was what the last part was I was going and interacting with performance. They were literally hugging me and crying. You know, it's that that one, and the other, other or many other things, and and that is one way to how really the audience are kind of reactive. And the other part is because I'm always trying to do something new in the sense, like the uh, experimenting and all these things. And so many times they always say, "Oh, it's not even art. It's not really like you know, God knows what she does. She's crazy." Kind of thing. And after maybe four years later they come and say, oh now I understand that kind of it's, it's kind of that reaction as well. Well Simone Beauvoir's second sex was when it came out it was termed as pornographic but now it's looked back as one of the most important texts of feminism. So a lot of things are recognized retrospectively. Um, I have I have questions but I'm going to open this up to the audience um, and yeah take those questions in. So actually I have three questions. So first is for uh, this means, is that uh, you keep referring to your uh, geographical area or your geographical location. But whenever it comes to the images, they are more universal. So if what, what is your concern? The identity of the country or the identity of um, culture that, uh, that has spread all around the world? As a project you mean? Yeah, like your personal intervention in the project, like how do you see that apart from your country's value? So I see myself as a Saudi American. Um, I'm born in the West, I grew up with two very Arab you know, parents and a very Arab culture, so even when I grew up in England and I went to an English school, I still had to be attending a nice Saudi school. So in, in order not to miss out anything, um, I see myself as a medium. I want to share the many 
facets that we share in common together. We cry the same, we celebrate the same, we have so many things in common with every different culture. Um, but the project itself is sharing, if it's just images, then yes, it's very universal. All the women are the same and their stories are shared by so many Western and, you know, part of the world and also the Eastern part of the world. We're all the same. We have the same love and hate relationship with our male counterparts. It was when you read the captions, they're very specific to Saudi Arabia, not even the region, but just to Saudi. And that's something that I wanted to kind of push um, for people to think. If you see the image, it's not always what you think. They are from a very, some of them are from very privileged backgrounds. But then even the Nepalis would relate when they read the caption of the struggle that they're all overcoming. And I like seeing that. I like seeing that I've changed someone's perspective about a different culture or race. Uh, and the second question is like, as Tanvi was continuously mentioning to all the historical movement that was happening, uh, I would try, like mention three of the interesting artists I just uh, came up with. One is Shinde Sherman, another is Pushpa Malayan, and the third is Tracy Emin. So, like three of them was like three of them are kind of inspired from each another in very different medium, or in or in the other way in in the kind of expression that they follow. So in, in the case of Kushmamala and Sindhi, we see this kind of universality that I was talking also about, Tanzim uh, also. So, but most of the case in Ashmina uh, specifically, she, she has this kind of personal uh, association with all the memories, all the things, and which can be also found in the works of Tracy also. And if we, like, Go back to the recent work of Tracy's that she's getting married with a stone, and uh, Lipia, uh, Lipima's, uh, Lipima's uh, <laughs> waving to herself. Like how 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 does this work like like works happen in this same arena? Like how does one personifies oneself as individual and then go versatile in this territory of universality? Are you asking me? I'm asking <laughs> this question to you. Oh, well, of course. Well, it's uh, so many times, uh, or uh, like usually, you know, from the West when they were uh, looking at the South Asian artwork, before they uh, kind of say, "Oh, it's all copied from the West," you know, that that kind of things is always playing. And so many times, actually, a few of my feminist friends also asked me, hey, you know, that menstruation thing has done in 60s by so many things, sanitary towel, blah, 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 all this there. Why the hell you are doing now? You know? But we are not looking at West. Of course, we know what is happening, but it is the lived experience journey we are encountering every day and what is art we express what we experience, you know, and so many things as a human being. We have similarities. We, we, I mean, if we happen to be in different parts of the world, different parts of things, but, you know, if it is, you cut someone, it bleeds and it cut, I mean, it hurts, you know, it happens to everyone. In that sense, what is in that patriarchy society, whether it is Hindu or any other culture or society, you know, how women's positions, how things are happening, and it is coming from that, that experience. It's a journey, it's not just like copy-paste somewhere, you know, and I think, I can see that in all of I think Tracy must have seen my work. <laughs> <laughs> and all info, I don't know any of the characters one, one thing you is I don't know any of them, so. So one thing, what, what would happen is like, you know, we can inspire, get inspired by so many. I mean, I get so inspired with so many of people, you know. That's why there are like hundreds of teacher I really kind of think. I, I really like Lip, you know, and then I, I get inspired with her. And I like her, you know, I, I get inspired, not just like life, but you know, inspired with her. One word, you might say something, it just treats me something. That's how it kind of happens. And also, this is not the time like it's like really local as such or global as such. It's a local time, you know? It's local, everything is mixing there. But 
that if you're talking about art, it's from the experience from the journey. If you just don't, if you are doing cut and paste, then it, work has no value. You can't even, you know, feel that. If I answer you. Is there any more question? We have time for one more question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I coming back to uh, what you were saying in your presentation that uh, you also said that you believe in human rights and you're humanists and and for me I've had a lot of struggle over the last few years of admitting whether I am a feminist or not a feminist and now I can say that I am but uh, somewhere for me it's that women have been denied and been suppressed and denied a lot of opportunity for so many years that right now for me feminism really means that to bring them up to a point of equality and then eventually everybody wants, I mean every, yeah. nobody wants one above the other but and somewhere going into the whole where you say where the Black, black Lives Matter movement was going on, um, there was this parallel thing where people said all lives matter but it's like saying, for me it's like saying if um, you know, there is something that needs immediate attention right now, and that is not excluding the other. So, the feminism is not excluding the male. It's fighting for the fact that both of them to become equal. So, I wonder why people actually shirk that um, opinion. Like, when you say that are you a feminist, they're like, no, we're actually not, we're humanists. So I want to know where that comes from. I, well, I understand that, like, when I was, I was speaking to Patrick Quiddy today, and I asked him, so there's a lot of female editors and National Geographic. He said, yes, but there are actually a lot more in other publications. Um, I also worked in a female-dominated, if not only female, because we were segregated in Saudi Arabia. So I, a lot of times, we are our worst enemy. And that's something that I feel like we should address. We're not supporting each other because we don't want to be called feminist, because we don't like that as a negative label. We're, you know, we're humanist, but then when it comes push and shove, we actually compete with each other. So maybe that's something we should talk about, that why it's not about navigating who's better, it's just I don't want her, so I'll support him. <laughs> Do you agree? Um, not really. Um, <laughs> because, you know, like this uh, gender thing is really constructed, you know, from the generation to generation. Being a woman, you should do that. Yes, kind of put in like that. And sometimes, you know, in our con in our context, people say, you know, women are the worst en enemy of women, and they say that. And then if we look at, you know, mother-in-law became the most dangerous villain in the world scenario. <laughs> Which is not true, you know, because she has been fed into that. But the mother is the one who taught her son to be sexist. That's what I mean. That's where we are. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I, 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 I'm, I, I, I'm coming to that point. You know, because she, she came, she was really, her brain was really washed into that thing. And, and then, then power, politics became something. Then that's how it, that kind of thing. So it's not her, but it, what it is put on her mind is acting that. So gender is like in that sense constructed. I would never think women is, I mean, sometimes somebody could be enemy of anybody. It's not really like that, but I would never say that one thing. And it is really how you are brought up, how you are kind of really, you know, in, in our continent, like the way women are brought up, or the whole janta is brought up, like, you know, to be like a cow. If you are Rosa, then you say, oh, how beautiful are you? You are like a cow, you know? That's how the compliment we get here, you know? And they really want you to be cow. But you and want then, to fly because your female housemate was the one who told you not to fly. But I, I, I agree she said that, but she is saying from what context? Because she never, she was brought up in like that how those type kind of thing. She never had an opportunity to ask questions. She thought, this is what my tradition, I'll take it. Tradition are something, I mean, good thing we should take it further. And culture is evolving, you know? Tradition is static, culture is evolving. And we live in this culture. And then that's where the whole mix of people put tradition and culture together like this. And it, they kind of take it further, and where it doesn't work, and then when you are put in that mindset, definitely they do. But 
in our context, when like people are really kind of open, do you think they are became enemy? No, they weren't. Because they were kind of put in that situation where they didn't have any access, any opportunity to really question in that context. That's what I believe. My only small example would be my grandmother, who I admire and love and adore. Um, she has six sons and four daughters. And whenever we would gather for Eid or any celebration, the men had to sit first. They would have to eat first. They would have to be served first. Is she a sexist or not? She definitely is. Whether she admits it or not, she is a sexist. And it pisses me off every time we gather because I'm like, why do they have to eat first? Yeah. Who, who allowed them I want to eat first? Yeah, but she doesn't know she is. But and yes, it is because of the culture. But her action is still the same judgment as I would judge a man who would say they have to be served first. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, I'm totally agree with your uh, what why your grandmother <laughs> said that. But would you say that now? You would not say that. If you say okay, men should not be doing, then I would say okay, women are the worst enemy. If you are not saying. On, on your younger generation, your friends are not saying that I would not say that. If your grandmother, I can understand her position, you know. So we, how, how we are in the position now in this transition period, where grandmothers or our mothers are could be really like sexist, of course, you know. But the our duty is really to change the way we are coming things. So now. I should be doing better, you know, or like kind of thing. So the competition should be with yourself, not with the other. And the the kind of like the society, the tradition, the education, what we put in our head here is like, you know, if you have to say I'm, uh, you know, fear color, then I have to show someone, oh, she's black, you know. If I have to say I'm really done or something good, then you have to say, she's really bad, that's why I'm good. It's not that way. You know? It has to be in a positive way. I, I, I think that's so right. I went on. <laughs> Definitely a good note to end that discussion. <laughs> it's nice to see that there is hope amongst this generation to change the stereotypes yeah. that have so existed hopeful, for a long you know? time. Yeah, I'm so hopeful. Thank you for the three of you for coming to this panel which closes our programming schedule for the festival.